I'd like to introduce Chris Krebs, who uh, today runs his own company, but until recently has been the director of the US government's Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's a very uh, colorful task, as I heard. Um, then uh, here we have uh, Helmut Clara, who is the Chief Enterprise Information Security Architect of the Austrian Railways, definitely a critical infrastructure. Then I would like to welcome Volker Pötsch, who is the Branch Chief in the Cyber, and IT, Cyber IT Department at the Federal Ministry of Defense in Berlin. And uh, I also like to give a warm welcome to Jeff Brown, the former Chief Information Security Officer of the City of New York. And uh, in your administration, though, where I understand there's uh, as many public servants as in half of Munich. So that's a pretty big organization. Um, so you see a lot of practical experience here um, on this podium. Our focus here now is not global theory, but it's um, the operational aspects, the pragmatic aspects. And the first question I would like to ask, and it's kind of an obvious one, um, that's perhaps in everyone's mind to Volker, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. How does that change how we need to deal and think and deal with the threat of our critical infrastructures? We all know what critical infrastructures are. Organizing democratic elections are also kind of a critical infrastructure. And I would just like to remind everyone that in the EU, we have just learned how dependent we are on Russian gas. If we consider telecom a critical infrastructure, in Germany, most of our 5G infrastructure is being built on Chinese technology. Is that something we want? Um, so have our leaders got the right mindset? So, Volker, what do you think? Um, how does the Ukraine invasion change the way we need to deal with critical infrastructures? So now, being uh, safe from the mouse, you still put me in danger of a lot of questions, but um, I still take just the first one uh, to set off. And uh, I would have a very short and boring answer. The Ukraine war hasn't changed anything. Because, and I think we already heard that today, there is, to be really precise, there's nothing new we see at the moment. What we see in Ukraine is a full-scale war fought in the cyber information room domain as well as in traditional domains, AL and C, by doctrines which have been written down in NATO and under, under other countries over the last years, which have been excessively war-gamed and which are now played out uh, in front of us. So, short, shortest answer could be nothing has changed. But of course that would be wrong, because a lot have, has changed, and we already heard that today also, but it's a lot about perception. We knew about these threats. We knew about the importance of critical infrastructure and the importance to protect critical infrastructure, to prevent evact attacks, and to be able to bounce back from attacks, so to survive, to operate. But I think what we lacked in at least, and please take this as a little provocation, what we lacked was the sense of urgency and sincerity in doing something out of this knowledge. And this, I think, has changed, or at least I hope this has changed, and it will stay changed, because it will decide if the Ukraine war can have at least a small, a very small positive point, if we are able to bring all these things together and really go a step forward. I mean, we heard that in the introductory note, a new social contract, and there's a lot which has to be done, and coming back to my own profession, of course, we as a military have a lot to do. And I hope we are doing it right now. You, might, you all heard about the special fund announced by our chancellor and uh, debated right now in the parliament. The extra 100 billion, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, and it probably doesn't come as a surprise that we at, last, at least are planning to put a very heavy emphasis on means of digitalization and especially communication and control. Um, but again, uh, it's, it's not something only for the military, it's not only something for the state, it's something for the, for the community as a whole. 
And there, I think really we have a change in perception and now it's the time to, to use this change. So no change, but a different perception. Is there anything you'd like to add from a US or your personal experience? I, I, I agree with that. In general, I think the perception from the government side, at least when I sat in government, was more of a security maximalist position. So you, know, you mentioned a Chinese telecommunications company that's building out German and other European uh, telecommunications networks. It's because the economic incentive structures lead to that. It, it is too difficult to go to the alternative, either from availability of production runs or just the sheer cost of it. So when you come at, from, it, from the private sector side, you have to look at it from a P&L perspective. And you know, what are the economics of the deal? And security costs money. Security is friction. Security is seen as an impediment or a barrier to doing what private sector businesses are supposed to do. And that's make money and deliver value to shareholders. So until I think we can solve that equation, absent any other external factors, we'll, we'll continue to be in this mindset. All that said, I do think that the last two and a half months have dramatically changed the way corporate leaders think about risk, like cyber risk, like dependency upon untrusted sources of technology. And they're making different decisions in what markets they want to be in, Russia, you're seeing this mass exodus from Russia, and those same companies are thinking now about like, well, what's the next geopolitical flashpoint that I need to be bracing for? Um, and, then, and then the second piece is not just what markets I wanna be in, but where do I wanna source my technologies that help drive my innovations? So I'm, I am seeing an awakening. I thought last summer I would have seen a greater awakening with Colonial Pipeline, and how cyber is a business risk, not just a technical risk. But now we're seeing it as a, this is a public perception risk. This is a stakeholder risk. This is an ESG risk. This is a social and corporate responsibility risk. So cyber is now up into the big leagues of risk management theory, at least. As it, at least we're getting there. How, do you, how would you, um, from a New York City point of view, look at this. Does Ukraine change anything or would you say same thing except as before except uh, more sense of urgency? I think the answer to that question is building on the previous two points and to sum it I think it comes down to tolerance and accountability. If you think about it what is becoming unbelievably uh, apparent as we all think about the war in Ukraine is there is a very low tolerance, thank goodness, for the types of impacts that cyber and other types of conflict can have and what people depend on. What people depend on is the critical services that are provided by their governments and the critical services that are provided by the private sector. So that's the first part. What is the tolerance? And I think people are waking up that there are things that we do not tolerate, tolerate so we have to do something about it. And the second piece of, is accountability, and we're also seeing that. Uh, for years, we've talked about pu public-private partnerships, and what we're realizing now is government, private sector, we're both accountable, and in order to meet that accountability to the people that depend on us to be successful, we have to work together. Some of you, have met, would you like to add? I fully agree with um, this topic because the um, companies of critical infrastructure and all other companies can do their homework, but for bigger issues we need support from military or from government and it makes, it, it covers um, one topic that we have to act together. We build up knowledge together, we have act together, we have fight together, maybe it's the wrong word, but we have to one cyber war against companies and hacker. And this we can only solve in a common way. Some of you have s spoken of a sense of urgency and uh, prioritization. I'd like to come back on that point. To me, cybersecurity is a C-level, a top-level issue. Do you see the right mindset with our political leaders? Political leaders? I mean, what country? <laughs> it depends. I, 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 <laughs> so 
Look, the, the kind of war college monographs, I've, I've used that line before, that will be written about the invasion of Ukraine will be fascinating. What were the intelligence wins? What were the intelligence losses? I think the U.S. intelligence community, with some of the Five Eyes partners, got it absolutely right on what Russia was intending to do in Ukraine. Others did not necessarily buy into it. What I think we missed was um, you know, how, the, the resilience of Ukraine and the Lion of Kiev and Zelensky. We missed that, and that's at least my take. Um, how does that, though, transition into this, the messaging and the sense of urgency from political leadership into those, at least in the United States, that own and operate critical infrastructure? And can, and can the critical infrastructure owners and operates actually action the guidance that's coming from government? And the plea that I've made is that you, as a critical infrastructure owner operator that are supporting the economy and society, have a responsibility to ensure that you are hardened and you are not a distraction to the political leadership and the, the government that is supporting the Ukrainians. Because a successful cyber attack by Russia on a US asset is going to not just have a disruptive effect on the critical infrastructure, it's also going to be a political distraction. It's going to lead to civil and social unrest in the United States. It is on the, we're coming up on a mid, critical midterm election in 22. Well, that would be fodder in the election. So everyone has a responsibility to hard, be a harder target. And I think that's in part where we, we there's a gap, there's a delta. Oh, I would, would gladly uh, go on with that because I really think we, we have to be fair. We have to be fair to our politicians as well as to ourselves. Um, and that's, that's the reason why I talked about urgency uh, as the main changing factor of perhaps. Um, it's not that we didn't do anything in the, in the past. Look, for example, at Germany. Of course, we have implemented our cyber defense center on a federal level to exchange information between different uh, parts of the federal and, uh, and the state administration very quickly concerning cyber threats. And I think it's definitely not perfect, but it's a very good first step. Again, coming back to the, to the armed forces, of course, we have our architecture already encompassing ideas like zero trust or uh, security by design or whatever. You all can name them. We've got them. In the past, it's been just a question about prioritization. And it's not so different between private sector and us. It always comes down to the budget and the question, what do I do with the budget? Or more, to be more honest, what can I do and what have I do, to do at this moment with my available budget? And um, as a private company has to, to yeah, be held accountable by, by their shareholders, we are held accountable by, by the taxpayers. So it's more or less the same situation. And we, we did all this but hopefully now we will be doing it faster. And again, with a, with a much more sense of urgency. And that's the real difference. So I wouldn't say we did something really wrong. We had to prioritize and this prioritization was done. Of course you could say, why wasn't more money uh, given to this? But to be fair and honest, you would also have to answer the question, where does this money come from? And where do you take it away from? And that's when it gets a little bit more complicated to answer. If I could add to this, um, just having worked in the de Blasio administration in the city of New York, and you have to think about the city of New York, 9 million people, 100 plus different departments and agencies, 340,000 employees, it's a $90 billion enterprise. What really resonated from a political perspective was a simple question, and it goes to the social contract conversation from earlier. What do New Yorkers depend on? They depend on core services, shelter, healthcare, justice, uh, transportation, water. And the question that came was, can this all get disrupted by a cyber event? The answer, of course, is yes. 
And to the point when it comes to the application of budget, what we observed is as we were given the centralized authority within the cybersecurity organization, we were also given the opportunity to help the city rationalize not how it was spending on cybersecurity dividends, but how it was spending on technology. And the reality is, as we adopt technology on behalf of our citizens or our clients, we are going to spend more and more and more on technology. So if you rationalize that and you bake security in from an engineering perspective, from a process perspective at the very beginning, you might find that you're actually spending taxpayer dollars or profits from the private markets with much more precision. That, in fact, is better. So I think to a certain extent, the, the, whether politics or corporate structures, when you add the economics of the discipline into it, you may find benefit. All right, thank you. So, Chris and Jeff, you mentioned technology. Is technology sovereignty a way forward? How does that play into cybersecurity um, in terms of um, exporting chips, uh, supplying our chips or systems from countries that we may or may not trust? Um, nobody in their right mind would source our weapon systems from hostile nations. What about our critical infrastructures? So how do you think technology sovereignty comes into play here? Is that an issue? So, so I, te technology sovereignty, there's a bit of duality of meaning here. So there's one meaning where technology sovereignty means you're dictating a certain um, indigenous proportion or percentage of technologies used in your government, in your industries. The Chinese do that. They've established percentages. China, the Russians are working to do, trying to do that as well. The flip side uh, definition is that you kind of have dominion over the technologies that are used within your enterprises and they're trusted. And I like to think of that more as a democratization of technology with a really heavy emphasis on the democracy piece. And I think that's where there are opportunities down the road for, and, and we're seeing this in part in the 5G conversation, of how do we establish a, a, com, a, you know, a set of common nations that have shared values of civil liberties, transparency, and rule of law that can come together and say, these are the, these are the principles that, that we want in our technologies and technology providers. Uh, and, and then you, you can incentivize the, the innovation piece. Uh, you, can, you can address some of the economics, because no single country is going to create a national champion in 5G technologies that can own the market alone right now, outside of China. It's just, it's not possible. So instead, how do you build that trading block? And it is not going to be just the US and Europe. You know, India is a key player here. The Global South is a key player as well. But you have to fix those inverted economics with heavily subsidized loans, predatory, uh, well, pricing and then predatory loans. So how do you get there? Um, you know, like I said, you build that block, but you also have to do it on the flip side where you disincentivize the behaviors that have led to digital authoritarianism. You hold them accountable. You hold the Chinese accountable for uh, intellectual property theft in, in commercial uh, you know, tech transfer. And one way I've thought about doing this is 2019, a company, CrowdStrike, released a report on how the Comac C-19, which is an airplane they've sold for regional jet, uh, it, it's comprised of about 26 different technologies. Half of them are stolen from Western companies. So there's a block then of democratic nations of these shared values that say, you're, you're not available to trade that technology because we can attribute and demonstrate. So we, we've got to have a little bit more creative uh, uh, thinking around the incentives and who's in and who's out. Any other views? Yep. Definitely. I mean, uh, I think nobody will discuss the point that we need sovereignty or, yeah, let's, let's stick with the term sovereignty. But as Chris already mentioned, the first question is whose sovereignty are we talking about? NATO, EU, Europe, Germany, a coalition of a, I don't know, number of states sharing the same values. Um, as a military guy, I say I need sovereignty because I do need to know that my systems do what I want them to do and only what I want them to do. Question is, how do I achieve this state? I can do it by knowing it from the scratch 
goes in the direction of security by design and so on, or by owning everything which is in it, I can do it, which is very cost-intensive and time-intensive, by certifying everything I buy afterwards, which could be argued isn't safe 100%. I know that. Um, but again, I think it's all about practical, practical, practicability, sorry, um, and what we can achieve in a, in a certain amount of time. Um, we have a certain need. This is to be sure about what we use. And now it's about to how we can fulfill that. And again, it's perhaps about the 80% solution and not about the 100% solution. So that's the reason why sovereignty, which means 100%, I sometimes take as the wrong term. Okay, thanks. Another thing that's on my mind is, um, how, should, how is there a way to overcome the skills gap between the public and private cybersecurity staff? On the one hand, uh, the public sector has a public mission, but they may not be able to attract all the right talent, like has been mentioned before. On the other hand, the, the people in the private sector may have the skills, but they may have other motives, not necessarily the public interest at heart. Um, any view on that? Jeff, perhaps? I think as an individual, I've certainly personally, professionally benefited um, from exposure to both the private sector and the public sector. And I think the intersection of both those sort of pursuits um, can be the mission. And to a certain extent, as I think about the ability to grow a workforce in the public sector, the public sector has an incredible amount of credibility because they have the authority to say, we are serving the people. That's an incredible driver of mission. And as the private sector you know, participates in that through its great innovation, advising capabilities, you start to see this wonderful exchange. And as long as you're o offering open doors between those two pursuits, then people can grow in their careers. Uh, I certainly think that you can get unmatched training across a whole set of disciplines if you're in the public sector, and you can have terrific like, benefit, experimentation, um, and really practical application in the private sector. So as long as the conversation's happening between both and you're pulling and pushing, then you can grow an absolutely fantastic workforce. Other views? Has it been an issue in, in where you work? The um, advantage of Austria is it is a small country, so we don't have this problem between public and private partnership, not because we are working together. We have a lot of models of private-public partnership, and there are also groups um, we are, as, as, as company, uh, give inputs for the official bodies. How can we make uh, models or guidelines? They are real working in a good and effective way for us. So the private-public partnership is, is really high established in Austria. Um, but there's a second point. Uh, you said before the Austrian Railway is part uh, of the critical infrastructure in Austria and our mission forced by the uh, stakeholder and, and, and owner, the Austrian government, is to keep the society and the economic in Austria up and running. So for this we have to transport goods and passengers from A to B in a safe and secure way. So it sounds like very simple. And it is a pretty cool and sexy job, but we have to handle with a lot of different technologies, um, complex systems, and we have to handle with uh, people's life. So, and independent, if we have a pandemic, independent of critical uh, or political, let's say, independences, um, or nature hazards and so on, nobody would ask how can we fulfill them, but we have to fulfill them and we are responsible. For this kind, the good news is we invest a lot of money in systems, in, in infrastructure and in cybersecurity. But the bad news are if we invest 100 times more, we never reach 100% of security. So this means maybe we have to change our mindset. The first point, go away from the cybersecurity is all to so the slogan, more or less, um, that the key is cyber resilience, and cyber security is a part of them. And to fulfill this, we need stable systems, we need 
secure systems. Uh, we need secure operating system. We are working with operating system. We don't know what they do. And we need a lot of money to make them secure. So why we don't have secure hardware, secure operating system made by EU? Sorry. <laughs> but this is just the best way for us. I can, perhaps just coming back to this, this question, can we close this, this gap between private sector and, and the public sector, I think. Um, short answer again, yes, we can. Um, but probably the only, only real way to do this uh, is cooperation. Uh, we already heard that. Um, can we, for example, again, as Federal Armed Forces, can we attract uh, enough personnel with the right skill set? I'm skeptical. We tend to have a certain haircut, not so uh, attractive for a lot of the IT geeks we're talking about. Um, the pay gap was already mentioned uh, during the former panel. Um, all this makes it a little bit um, hard. Do we stop in trying? No, of course not. Um, we tend to attract a lot of people with different skill sets. We train them very well and we give them great opportunities because sometimes with the armed forces, they may do things they couldn't, or at least shouldn't do, in the private sector. Uh, and that can be right, quite interesting for one or the other. Um, so, but coming back to the, to the real answer, yes, we can do it, but it's again, we're in this, in this new social contract, we have to do it together. It's all about the public and the private sector working together. And please do not forget, we're talking about the private sector, this is not a unity. We've got very large critical infrastructure companies. They don't have any problems com competing with us or the world. But we also got SMUs, which have definitely have much greater problems and have the same question. How do we, as a private company, close the gap to these large companies? So this is what I think of as a defend today, secure tomorrow problem. And what that means is that there are things we can do today. We can automate certain tasks to take that human element out of it and push the humans towards a higher order bit and a higher order problem. We can retrain trans or provide training to transitioning to, you know, military uh, veterans and things like that. But, but if, if we don't fix the underlying structural problems, we're going to be fighting this battle for forever. And, and some of those structural problems are frankly, in the education system. So I live in the Washington, D.C. area. I have five kids, and I look at the education that's available to them, and from a computer science and you know, software engineering or coding perspective, it's just not readily available in the public system or in the private school system. So how the heck are we going to compete, compete in the longer term? So we have to invest in the future, or we are going to be fighting this battle we're going to be having the same panel 30 years from now. After, yeah. All right. I was going to make a bad joke about COVID-32 or something, but. <laughs> Interesting infrastructure problems. Um, one thing I was going to ask you as well is, um, obviously, there's more and more threats. The cost to defend goes up exponentially, and you're never going to get 100% secure. So. Should we look into shifting a focus from protecting our infrastructure to just accepting a certain vulnerability, but focusing more on business continuity? Is that a viable model or is that nonsense? If I can jump in on that, I think that was one of the great observations serving New Yorkers. When we thought about what they needed and the types of impacts and consequences that would be paid by a cyber event, we thought as the whole apparatus working together. And I think to a certain extent, bringing a conversation around resilience and then including not just the cybersecurity silo, but the additional continuity of operations, capabilities of any organization or organizations together is the right approach. I don't necessarily accept as an individual that, all, that there will always be a threat that will be successful. I, I, I don't accept that we cannot succeed and defend. With that said, I like the expanded definition of being successful by saying, if for some reason there's a cyber event, I've got a number of different people along the line with different authorities and capabilities to help succeed. Uh, so that's the way I like to think about it. All right. Other views? 
Uh, yes, of course. Um, let's have a look behind the last two years. Um, I think there is a lot we can learn about what happened. There are positive aspects from EU and, and official bodies to make standards to force security. Thank you for this. Also, uh, like in ESA, there are also a lot of power for this. But on the other hand, we had a lot of uh, negative topics. They have a massive input of security and safety for the systems. So, I said before, we never reach 100% of security. So, we need both. We need uh, the operations from the pre-active part to prevent and detect um, incidents. Uh, and we need also the business continuity management if something happens to, to uh, start up our systems again. We need both in a balanced way, I would say. I would really like to pick up where Geoff uh, stopped. Um, I loved your, your saying, as an individual, I sh uh, won't accept that uh, there always remains a certain threat. And I would go on and say, even as organizations, we shouldn't uh, accept this, um, because it leads to the best effort. But at the same time, we should also always realize that not accepting doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And that's what I meant uh, when, I, when I tried to define, to defend earlier on in the panel. Uh, defense is in the first step about preventing a successful attack. But in the second, it's always about bouncing back um, or staying operational on a probably lower level, but coming very very quickly back to the, to the level you do need to operate. Uh, resilience, the, the classical term in this. And I think that's what we, what we really have to focus on. So again, I don't think we need a change or a shift in strategy. We again have to build up on, perhaps it's also an educational um, issue because as a society we have to understand this. There is no 100% no security. And there won't be a 100% security. It can't be, because there's nature, for example. Tomorrow I can get hit by a meteorite. Yeah, I'll be dead. So I can try to defend myself against it. I probably will be successful, because tomorrow evening I won't be hit by a meteorite. Um, but to be not to coming back to it, again, I think um, no shift but being clear about this and being more honest to ourselves as an as an society, as individuals and as organizations. And that's really important because when we do this, we come back to the questions of prioritization uh, when we're talking about funds and budgets and so on. Money. It, I, I think bu building on that, the resilience piece, I think also if this is a risk management problem, and if you think about risk management, risk is the classic combination of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. I think we've really invested heavily in understanding threat and mitigating threat. We, we're working on the vulnerability piece and understanding where are vulnerabilities in our systems, our misconfigurations, and addressing those. I, I think what we don't do enough of is managing the consequence variable. And I, I've seen that in the US government, where all the prioritization is on the threat piece, and then you move down the gradient towards, towards uh, vulnerability, but consequence is a wide open space. And so if we can focus on that and understanding it through the, through the traditional business continuity planning perspective and what, those, you know, what your recovery time objectives are and things like that, you start baking that more and more into IT operations and the dependencies we have, including on third-party service providers, and how bad a cloud shock would hit us if AWS, Azure, GCP, whatever, drops out tomorrow. Like those, I think that's the, the discipline where uh, we, we need more maturity and we need more investment. If I can add on that, I think to a certain extent we need incentive to do so. And right now, if you look at how interconnected we all believe we certainly are digitally, I, the incentive is that we realize that you know, as we observe an, a war, from a digital perspective, we are connected. And that is a very strong incentive. Because you know, though some of us are so far away, what happens proximate to that geography through digital means is directly able to impact our critical infrastructure and our, our trust mechanisms. Like imagining that Maxar technology's got down, for example. 
Maybe one additional point to, ma to manage the risk you said before, we need people to have knowledge about. So, and I googled on the trip to Munich um, how many universities or, or schools uh, offer IT security. So, it's not really much. And then I googled about OT security for the critical infrastructure. I receive a result with zero foundings. So at this point, we need a, a push for the digital literacy. Um, let's make a, a simple experiment. Every unpatched device, every unpatched device can be used as zombie for DDoS attacks to our critical infrastructure systems or other systems. So it's it's not very really difficult. Who of you? So we have to start at our own self. Same as mine. Who of you have configured your DSL router in a secure way at home? Okay, <laughs> and, and who doesn't? What is configured? I'm, uh, I mentioned I have five so, kids, so right? What like, we that's have, hard. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. So we, what we have to do is to, to raise up the digital literacy at the, the society, starting at us and, and, and ending at the university and academic line. All right, interesting. I'd like to switch subject a little bit um, and touch on the operational aspects of two emerging technologies. Everyone's talking about blockchain and quantum computing. How does that affect cybersecurity? Blockchain is an architecture that by definition is built trustless. Does that make cybersecurity guys' job easier? Do uh, quantum computers that make it a lot harder because they can hack anything or crack any code, any views? So just a, a quick anecdote on blockchain and cryptocurrencies in particular. So I've long been banging the drum on ransomware. And I think the last time we were here in 19, I talked about the, the national security threat that was ransomware. There are three problems with ransomware in general. First is that uh, the, the install base is still too easy to hit. You know, the, the vulnerabilities, the bad guys have just figured out how to monetize misconfigurations and vulnerabilities. The second is that there are financial instruments outside of the fiat economy regulatory mechanisms in cryptocurrencies and exchange wallets and things like Suez Exchange that allow for that transfer outside of law enforcement. The third is that th there was a safe haven or harbor in Russia that would allow this ecosystem to, to thrive. The problem that we saw, at least in the United States, was we actually don't know what the denominator is in ransomware because no one's reporting it to the federal government. There's, there's about a 15 to 20 percent, maybe, understanding of the types of ransomware attacks. Really, the only person that knows how many ransomware attacks there are are the ransomware actors themselves. And the, the, the issue here is that if we had more timely reporting of ransomware events with key indicators, including the wallets that you're sharing the cryptocurrency uh, ransomware payments into, if you shared that with a cryptocurrency forensic team and law enforcement, due to the immutable characteristics of the blockchain, you could actually probably disrupt and recover like they did after Colonial last year. So there are incentives, but the, again, the legal mechanisms that are in place, the fear of reporting. So there are advantages to the blockchain, to the, cyber, the cybersecurity community. We're just not realizing them for various <coughs> lawyers' reasons. Very interesting. Um, I would take quantum computing. Um, short version, uh, curse and a blessing, for the military at least. Um, it's a curse because it makes uh, secure communication and everything which has to do with encryption a lot harder. A blessing, because for me as a military, not for me as a person, it makes cracking the other guy's uh, secure communication a lot easier. Um, so again, it's uh, about this balance. And it's always about the situation I'm in at the moment, uh, what it will give me. Um, our answer is we are research, researching quantum computing at our Federal Armed Forces University here in Munich um, because we very early started to think about this point and it's something very high up on, on our agenda. So you're saying it makes sense to spend time thinking about 
quantum computing and also blockchains because it is relevant. Jeff. I was just going to say, especially on quantum, um, it, it never helps society to back away from innovation. And if you just think from a math perspective of what quantum is, it allows the computation of exceptionally, almost unfathomable problems, which means if applied correctly, we can solve exceptional, unfathomable problems. So by no way should security stand in the way of it. In fact, we should run towards it because we have a lot of problems to solve. Um, yesterday, I was on a security and risk management event in, in Austria, and there was one of the master people of quantum computing in Austria also there, and he has a presentation about. And he said, one of the big benefits of our actual uh, encryption methods are that the decryption needs a much more longer time than the encryption. So, and he was proud to present that the quantum computing uh, needs less time for decryption, or the same time for decryption as encryption. So, and if I'm asking, okay, but what does it mean for the security community? Does it mean we lost our benefit of encryption? Because the hacker need the same time to decrypt what we encrypt. Yes. So, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it, quantum computing is a benefit for the security if we don't have a look about how we use them. To a certain amount, Helmut killed my joke, um, because of course it's it's true that uh, quantum computing will give us uh, special uh, opportunities and, and new capabilities in terms of our own encryption. Um, but I just can't go out in in some shop and buy a totally new equipment for the whole armed forces. So I will always have this transitional phase where I have the old equipment, and this will be uh, in danger by quantum computing. Uh, as well as in the new equipment, which will bring the advantages of quantum computing to the table. So I try to have my joke surviving. I'm sorry. R real quick, and maybe you know Peter to think about next year's agenda. An issue that I think we're not paying enough attention to right now, and this is another one of those defend today, secure tomorrow problems, is Web 3.0, decentralized finance, smart contracts. The, the risk that that is being uh, levied out right now is incredibly complex and it's flying under the eye of regulators and I, I don't I don't think we have a full appreciation of, of what is uh, what's being held on to out there right now with that I think we've run over time I hope it was interesting to all of you great questions thank you give me a big give, give a big round of applause to this podium here <laughs>